It's a great Sunday morning. Welcome everybody here at our service at GBC. Welcome to all of those uh, friends and family members who are logging in from uh, different parts of the world. We're grateful to have you with us. Uh, I hope that you are all doing well uh, despite what's going on around us with the COVID and now these, um, you know, there are a lot of protests going on that, uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't ignite a second wave of COVID because a lot of people are gathering in, in mass to, um, to um, you know, uh, protest what's going on in the States. Um, I, I mean, you know, I have nothing against the protests, but I just hope that they are all, you know, doing what they need to do in terms of the other thing that we're facing right now. Uh, I hope that they're practicing. I don't know if they can practice social distancing or anything like that, but I hope they're just wearing the mask or taking the necessary precautions uh, so that this, 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 this wave of the virus doesn't, um, you know, doesn't get worse. So um, there's a lot of things going on around us. The, the hottest topic right now in terms of media and the news uh, is that of racism. Uh, and again, the multiple protests going on around the world. Uh, and these protests is to you know, voice out our, our disagreement uh, when it comes to racial discrimination and to, um, you know, to put an end to racial uh, discrimination. Um, and I, I know I haven't said any much about it. I've said a little bit about it, but I'm going to take the, the first part of the sermon right now to kind of, you know, um, share with you my, my take on it, my stand on it. Uh, and I'm referring specifically uh, to the BLM movement, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that is currently sweeping across North America and even around the world. Um, but generally, I'm referring to uh, any form of racial uh, inequality uh, that is still happening in our society today. It's sad uh, that it's still going on, uh, especially in North America where, you know, there's, there's multiple multiple uh, different, different cultures that are here, living here. Uh, it's sad that it's still happening uh, even, in, even today. Uh, and I know they're, you know, just looking through Facebook and looking through uh, posts, people's posts you know, on Twitter, on Instagram, there's a lot of disagreements uh, regarding the uh, importance of these protests and uh, what we as a society uh, should be talking about and should be focusing on. Uh, and it's sad to see because we're supposed to be all on one team against this one enemy. Um, but what's happening is right now, uh, the people in the same team are kind of, um, you know, fighting against each other, which is, um, you know, which is, it goes against what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, what we're trying to accomplish and what we're trying to reach is that of racial unity and harmony. Uh, but instead, where we keep, you know, people who are, you know, going against injustice and, and racial inequality are fighting against each other on how to do it. Um, and it's sad because we're not going to overcome racial inequality if uh, we have that kind of attitude that if, you know, you don't agree with me, that means you disagree with me. If you're not with me, that means you're against me. Um, it's not like that. Um, we just have different uh, views and different op opinions about certain things that, uh, you know, don't necessarily go against uh, your own, your, your opinion or, or my opinion. So uh, there's no sense of, um, you know, fighting over it because ultimately we're supposed to be fighting for the same uh, cause. And um, it, it's, it's sad that it's, that's what's happening right now, uh, that there is no unity when it comes to, um, you know, the fight against uh, racial inequality. Uh, and I think it's because we're trying to uh, attack this enemy from the surface. Um, uh, the way I see it is that this racial inequality, this this the racism that's going on in our uh, in our world today, is like a it's like a weed. Uh, it keeps coming up. It keeps popping up every decade or so. It keeps popping up. Um, it'll be quiet for a little while, but then you know it starts boiling up again, and then, then it blows up in an event just like what happened to. Uh, George Floyd, and then everybody is on uproar. Uh, and then we try to get rid of that weed by uh, some of us, we, we think that, oh, to get rid of this weed, we just have to spray it uh, with something. Or some of us, we just have to cut it and just lawn mower over it. Um, and we're not really getting to the root of the, of the problem because another 10, another 10 years passes by and 
there it is again. It's, it's, it's up again. So I think, um, you know, from a Christian point of view and from a biblical point of view, the only way for us to overcome this societal issue uh, is first of all for us to work together for each other. Uh, we need to work together for each other. Uh, and it, again, it, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. Or you're part of the same team uh, if you're against racial inequality. That's the first thing we need to do, work together for each other. Second, uh, we shouldn't let anger or frustration dictate what we do as a society uh, in the hopes of eliminating the problem of racism. Uh, anger versus anger and hatred versus hatred is not going to amount to anything positive. It's not going to amount to anything good. Uh, instead, what we, sh we should be doing as a society is we should be cultivating a culture of love and unity. Uh, that is colorblind. Uh, you know, I, that's what I love about dogs. Uh, I don't want to compare humans to dogs, but, um, but just to use as an illustration, dogs are colorblind. They don't care who their master is, what color their skin is. Um, they are loyal just the same. And you, you see dogs in the street. They don't care what kind of dog it is, if it's a bulldog or if it's a husky. If they're dogs, they sniff each other out. They get to know each other, and, and they just play. Um, obviously, there's going to be fights sometimes, but it's not about, oh, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a bulldog and you're a husky. It's not about that, uh, because ultimately, they're all the same um, race, so, so to speak. They're the dog race, uh, and we as human beings uh, are of one race. Uh, we're of the human race. Yes, we come in different colors and different sizes and different uh, ethnicities, but ultimately, we come from, we're all in the same team. We're all in one race. Uh, and I say that because biblically, as far as the Bible is concerned, um, there's no such thing as racism. Uh, the Bible talks about love your neighbor as yourself. Love your brother. Uh, you know, love your sister. Uh, doesn't matter what color they are. Uh, our call as Christians is to love our neighbor as ourself uh, or we don't. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, we don't. <laughs> and that's, that's the root cause of what racism uh, is. And uh, if you look at the Bible, again, uh, racism is basically defined as just a hatred of another human being, regardless of what color they are. Uh, that's the way I see it from Scripture. Uh, it's just a hatred of another human being, uh, regardless of their color. Uh, and really, if you think about it, uh, as a Christian, as a believer, anything that stems from hate is ultimately uh, sin. Uh, and the only thing, okay, that can defeat sin that the Bible shows us is that of love. Uh, and so uh, let me quote Martin Luther King Jr., one of the great advocates of, uh, you know, racial uh, equality. Uh, he once said this, and I quote, uh, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Uh, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Uh, and, and I think that's exactly what the Bible talks about. And I think when we look at uh, Martin Luther and the way he did it, the way he protested against racial inequality, everything that he did was backed up by Scripture foundation of everything that he did was scriptural uh and and i think that's why even today we talk about him um as one of the great advocates of racial equality uh so um uh, so my opinion and my my take on this matter is this that ultimately uh, racial inequality uh will not be solved by politics or protests i'm not saying that you shouldn't protest i'm not saying that the pol politicians can't do uh, anything to solve it uh, but uh, if racism is not, uh, you know, skin deep or it's not about skin color, it's about the heart, it's about the hatred in the heart that boils up into the hatred of another race, um, then ultimately um, politics and even protests is not going to solve it. Uh, and again, uh, I base this on uh, just looking throughout history. Um, you know what? Uh, uh, we've seen protests after protests. Uh, we've seen riots uh, over the years because of racism. We've seen people march uh, against racism before. Um, but again, the problem, this problem of racial inequality, which 
existed even in the 1920s and even before that. Um, even though we, we've done all the protesting, we've done all the, the marching, uh, it still pops its ugly head. A uh, hundred years later, it's still here. Uh, so what we need to do uh, as a society, uh, again, is not to attack it from the surface where we just spray stuff on it, cut the weed of racism, uh, and then just leave it for a while, and then after a few years it comes back. That's not how we get rid of it. It's because it's just going to keep coming back over and over again. We need to cut the root of uh, what, it is, what it is that makes people racist. Uh, and, and, and that is the, the hatred in the heart of every sinful human being. There is, there is something in us that <laughs> obviously drives us to be hateful towards another person. Um, and again, regardless of what um, color their skin is, uh, it could be um, Filipino versus Filipino or you know, black on black, white on white. Um, there's all kinds of uh, forms of, uh, you know, um, hatred that just pops up in the heart of uh, sinful human beings. And, uh, and unless we learn how to love one another, as the Bible prescribes, um, racism will always uh, exist uh, because it's a fruit of that hatred uh, in the hearts of um, sinful human beings. Now, uh, I know it sounds grim, uh, it sounds hopeless, uh, but if we were to be truly honest with ourselves, the main issue really is not of skin color, um, but a sinful heart uh, that bears hatred towards another that causes them to do injustice or harm to that other person. Um, because we can't just look at racism as just, you know, um, skin color. Because not all white people are racist. Um, not all Filipinos are racist. You know, there are some of us who are, uh, but not everybody is. Um, but all of us have that tendency to kind of like, you know, um, hate somebody else, no matter what they do. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's, it's not about because they're white or they're black or because they're whatever. Um, it's because of the hatred in in our hearts. That's where the root of racism uh, exists. Uh, and again, just like what Martin Luther King Jr. said, the only thing powerful enough uh, to, to defeat that hatred uh, is love. Uh, and I'm not talking about a, 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 a tolerant kind of love, like we just tolerate each other. No, the Bible calls us as believers uh, for a different kind of love, a kind of love that cannot be generated, it cannot be uh, learned, uh, or it cannot be forced. This kind of love is a gift that can only come from God. And us receiving this gift is us seeing how God loved us first through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how this love is, is given to us. That's how we take hold of this kind of love that no matter what happens around us, no matter what somebody else does towards us, um, we love them still. Jesus called us to do that. Not, not just love our neighbors, but love even our enemies. Uh, and as a Christian, and looking at this from a Christian point of view, um, I think that's ultimately that's the solution uh, for racism. Um, and, and I know that's why there's a lot of disagreements that are popping up um, as we fight against this, this same enemy is because everybody has their own opinion. Nobody's, you know, and, and people, based on who their friends are, who they agree with, they go with that opinion. And whoever goes against that opinion is against them. And, and then disagreements happen. Uh, but we're all on the same team, just like what I said earlier. Um, but if we were to uh, put God's word above all our opinions and above uh, all our strategies when it comes to racism, then there's authority in it. Uh, and hopefully that authority um, will take hold of your heart as well, uh, and you will submit to that authority by faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a team, as one unit, as, uh, uh, as one race, we're able to fight against injustice, uh, which is ultimately what the problem is. Uh, the problem is that is injustice. Um, and we can talk about injustice, not just in, in racial terms, but even to the poor. There's injustice being done to the poor all over uh, the country, uh, all, all over the world. Uh, I see a lot of people, uh, I see somebody, one of my friends posted that 
that's the next big big movement uh, is to march for the poor and for those who are oppressed uh, because there's a lot of those that, that going on there's injustices done to believers right now in Nigeria uh, to Christians who uh, are just being Christian <laughs> they're not trying to hurt, hurt anybody they're just trying to be Christian and there's this group that hates them they're the same race they're the same nationality they're the same ethnicity um, but um, they're they're being killed uh, over there in Nigeria uh, so that's injustice as well should we shouldn't we march for that as well as believers because that's the big problem that we have right when this COVID thing happened um, there's a lot of racism that was thrown towards the the, the Chinese people that's injustice as well uh, nobody <laughs> None of the Chinese, uh, I think, wanted this to happen, but it happened, and because it came from them, um, everybody was um, being, um, you know, not nice towards towards them, being racist towards them. That's an injustice as as well that we should be that we should be fighting. Um, and again, root of that is that sinful heart that we have as human beings, and the only cure for that is that of love and a love that is sacrificial a love that comes from god uh, by seeing his love for us through faith in the lord jesus christ uh, so as christians i encourage you uh, i know it's hard to see it this way because sometimes we let our anger kind of block the way we see things and we use that anger as a lens to look at the world but again we, you can't we can't do that as believers because only, anger only begets more more anger on the same team so we should uh, be unified in our fight against the injustices that are being done uh, in the world and i think uh, once we look at our text today that's the lesson that we're going to learn from paul and the philippian church um, that they have one goal they both have only one goal and that is to spread the gospel and they work towards that goal they're not bickering with each other on how to to get towards that goal their I mean, purpose is no, we need to get towards this goal, and that's it. They have one mindset, uh, and I think that that's what we can learn from our text uh, this morning. And, um, and again, that mindset is driven or is fueled by their love for, uh, first of all, the, for the Lord Jesus Christ and for uh, one another. So that's what we're going to see in today's text. Uh, I hope that uh, I'll be able to show it to you, um, and I hope that you'll be able to see it by the help of uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but before we do that, let's just do a quick review. Um, my timers are off, so I don't know how long I've been talking. But um, let's just do a quick review of what we took up last week. Um, and if you missed it, uh, it's, it's on YouTube. You can watch it uh, again. Uh, or if you haven't seen it, uh, you can watch it there. So we began last week by uh, taking up the greeting. Again, Philippians is a letter, so we need to read it as such. Okay? It's, not a, it's not a narrative. It's not a poem. So it's a letter, so we need to read it as such. So first is the greeting of Paul. Uh, and in the greeting, if you can still remember, the main message of Paul is that of unity, uh, working side by side. Nobody is different from one another. We are both, even though Paul is an apostle, he put himself at the same level as everybody else, um, namely Timothy and the rest of the church in Philippi, all for one goal, for the sake of the spread of the gospel. So... Um, and we, um, we also looked at, um, you know, part of the, uh, the, uh, the greeting that Paul wrote in, in the Philippians, if you remember from last week, was that he mentioned the church's leaders in the greeting, the elders and the deacons, or the overseers and the deacons. Now, I said that uh, Paul, Paul's purpose, I said this last week, Paul's purpose for specifically mentioning leaders uh, of the church uh, it's, it's two, two things. Uh, first, to show honor to the office uh, of the leader, uh, meaning that they are called to a higher office. Uh, and second, uh, to encourage these leaders to serve with or alongside of the church and not hover over them, like, you know, lord it over them, their leadership. Uh, that's not uh, what leaders are supposed to, to do. They're supposed to serve the church uh, and serve their Members. Those are the two things I mentioned last week, but I, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, there's a third reason uh, why Paul specifically mentioned the church's leadership in his greeting, uh, and it may be related to an issue 
that is mentioned in chapter 4. So we're going to skip over to chapter 4, uh, verses 2 and 3 right now in Philippians. Uh, and I want you guys to, to, to go there with me right now and read alongside me. Uh, chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Verse 2. Uh, I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Okay. Verse 3. Yes, I ask you also, true, compa true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So there's a lot of things in, those ver in that verse right there. Uh, first of all, these these uh, leaders that he um, that Paul mentions in in this verse are both women. Um, so um, I mean, we'll get it when we get to chapter four, but that's interesting, right? Uh, back in those days, the the women were uh, considered as uh, leaders, always the men. But here in the in the Philippian church, women are the ones who are who are leading. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make when it comes to Paul's greeting, why he mentions elders and deacons, is that there is some disagreement uh, that is going on between two of the, the leaders of uh, the church, uh, Judea and Syntyche. Uh, and this disagreement is threatening to destroy the unity when it comes to the leadership group within that church. So what does Paul do? Nip the problem right in the bud. He cuts off the root of the problem right away by reminding these leaders to work together in his greeting. That's why he called them out as well. Uh, so he, decide, he addresses the issue right away. But that's what Paul did in his greeting in encouraging the leadership not only to work together alongside the church or with the church, but also to work with each other as leaders. Um, so I think that's what Paul is doing as well when he um, uh, addressed the leader specifically in his greeting to the Philippian church and again it's the same theme the same topic of unity that's the only way that this is going to work if we are united and pulling the same direction towards the same goal uh, which in Paul's case and the Philippians case is the gospel the spread of the gospel um, in our case is the fight against injustice and racism nowadays right so uh, that's the theme that we're going to continue to see here as Paul um, uh, offers up a prayer uh, of thanksgiving in the text that we have for this morning uh, in verses 3 to 8. Uh, we're going to be spending the rest of our time there. I don't know how much time I have left, uh, but uh, hopefully it'll fit within the hour or so that, I'm, uh, that I've allotted for this. Uh, so uh, grab your Bibles, to, uh, turn it to Philippians 1. Uh, we're going to take up uh, just a couple of verses um, right now, verses 3 to 5. Uh, but I want you guys there. Uh, we're going to camp out here. So let's read it one more time. Philippians 1, verses 3 to 5. I thank my God for uh, in, in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This is how we're going to do it, and we've always done it this way. Take it up verse by verse, uh, so follow along if you can at home. So just to paraphrase verses 3 and 4, we're going to begin with verses 3 and 4. Paul is saying that he is thankful to God every time he remembers his friends at Philippi. Right? That's what he's saying. I'm thankful every time I remember you. Um, so he's thankful to God every time he remembers his friends at Philippi. And how it brings him joy every time he prays for them. Right? That's what Paul is saying in verse 3 and 4. So right at the beginning, uh, Paul is setting a tone for this prayer. Uh, what's the tone he's, that he's setting? That, that of joy in thanksgiving or a thankful kind of joy to God for his friends at Philippi. For the church in Philippi. Right? A joyful thanksgiving. Uh, for his friends in Philippi. And the question is, why? Uh, why is he so joyful and thankful every time he remembers and every time he prays for his friends at Philippi? It's because of verse 5, right? Verse 5 says, because, what? Of your partnership 
in the gospel from the first day until now. So Paul is thankful every time he remembers the Philippian church. He is joyful every time he prays for the Philippian church because, verse 5 says what? Of their partnership with Paul. Where? In the gospel. And notice at the end of verse 5, it says, from the first day until now. So what we need to do is we need to ask questions so we can interpret this verse properly. First of all, first question that sh arises for me and hopefully for you, what does Paul mean by partnership in the gospel? What does he mean by that? Second, um, when was the first day that this partnership was established? And again, the last part of verse 5 says that, right? From the first day until now. So let's check out Philippians chapter 4 once more. Uh, we're not going to uh, interpret this, these verses. They're just using it for, as a cross-reference for us to interpret uh, verses uh, 4 and 5. Or sorry, just verse 5. We're going to use Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 to 18. It says here, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, receiving except you only. Right? 16, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Verse 18, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So when Paul says, verse 15 again in, 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 in chapter 4, in the beginning of the gospel, that's what he says, right? As you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel. When he said that, what he means is that when he first shared the gospel to the Philippians, right? When, I first shared, when he first shared the gospel to the Philippians until he left for Macedonia. Right? So what happened, again, if you remember the first session, Paul, Timothy, Silas, they went to the region of Macedonia. They met some people uh, at the city of Philippi, uh, and they shared the gospel to them alongside the jailer. Uh, and then those are the people that started the church in, in Philippi. That's what Paul is talking about here in verse 15. Right? So Paul, that's when it started. That's when the church started, when he shared the gospel to them. Uh, and then um, they are the ones who started the church in Philippi until uh, that's what Paul says, until he left for Macedonia. Macedonia is the region where Philippi is in, the city of Philippi is in. Um, when that happened, and after he left, the only church that partnered with Paul, okay, from that region is the Philippian church. That's what Paul is saying. The only church that partnered with him is the Philippian church. Now, what does it mean to partner, uh, you know, to, to partner in the gospel? Notice how in, in verses 16, they partnered by supporting Paul. Right? They supported Paul. How? Just by prayers? No. They supported him practically. They sent him whatever it is that he needed. Uh, it, it, that can be food or that can be money or that can be whatever. Uh, but it's an objective way. It's, 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 a, it's a practical way of support, not just through prayer. I'm, I'm sure they prayed for him as well, but they also supported him practically. Even when he was in Thessalonica, when he was planning a church there, the Philippian church was still sending him help uh, for his needs. Uh, can you imagine that kind of, of support? Uh, so the, again, the Philippian church did not just pray for him. They showed their support in practical ways. So much so that they even sent their own member, Epaphroditus, in order to deliver support to Paul in Rome. Because this time when he wrote the Philippians, he was in house arrest in Rome. And when you think about it, so, so what? Uh, Epaphroditus is a messenger sent to Paul in Rome. Easy. Just send it. You know, Epaphroditus, go to Rome, bring your package, and, and, and give it to Paul. Uh, sounds easy, but that job is not easy. Check out Philippians 2, verses 25 to 30. Philippians 2, 25 to 30. 
I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow 28 i am the more eager to send him therefore that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that i may be less anxious 29 so receive him in the lord with all joy and honor of such and honor such men for he nearly died for the work of christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me wow i could preach a whole sermon just on that passage Right? See how Paul describes Epaphroditus. Okay? Epaphroditus was not just a delivery boy. He was his brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and a messenger. So basically, Paul's doing the same thing he did in his greeting to, with Timothy. Okay? He saw Epaphroditus as an equal, right? as a brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, fellow messenger of the gospel, and not just the gospel, but the blessings and that uh, the Philippian church was, uh, was sending Paul at that time. So again, Paul, if, for Paul, Epaphroditus was not, that, was not just a UPS delivery dude. Uh, Paul was, was you know, considering Epaphroditus as his equal. Uh, and Epaphroditus was worthy to be considered such because imagine the lengths, again, that Epaphroditus had to go to in order to accomplish his delivery mission. Uh, I, I, there were no buses, no trains in, in those days. There was no airplane. Uh, there was only, you know, camels and, and probably just your feet to get you to wherever you need to go and, uh, and boats, right? So if you think about it, from Philippi to Rome, it's about um, 1,970 kilometers in those days from Philippi to Rome. A lot of that is spent on land. Some of it you have to cross sea and then uh, walk again that's what Epaphroditus did he walked until he reached water took a boat and then uh, when he reached land he walked some more and that's how he got the package and supplies to Paul so he just walked he was walking with the packages okay who knows what they said uh, Paul but I'm sure after walking 1900 mile, uh, 1900 kilometers, uh, whatever that is, is going to start feeling heavy. Uh, but that's what happened to, uh, that's what Epaphroditus had to go through uh, in order to deliver, you know, the supplies to Paul. Uh, on top of that, Paul said in his own words, in his words, that he, he became ill. Epaphroditus was sick. Uh, I'm not sure if the traveling had anything to do with it or, or whatever, but the uh, point is, he became ill. Uh, and, and whatever that illness is, is, is obviously it's not good for him. Uh, and, and Paul says in, in chapter 2, he almost died because of this uh, illness. Uh, and I think for me, uh, after reading that, I just, just, that just showed how devoted uh, a brother is, uh, is Epaphroditus, right? Uh, the, how devoted uh, the Philippian church must be uh, as a partner to Paul. Uh, first of all, they never wavered in their support for, for Paul, uh, both spiritually and materially or practically. Uh, and for them to have somebody in their church who was willing to go through all these challenges uh, of traveling, especially in those times, shows what kind of a church they are, what kind of, a, what kind of, a, uh, what kind of preaching they must have uh, for, for somebody, one of their members to be willing to do this and just not just willing and uh, I don't think he was obligated to do it but he did it with uh, with joy um, and again I think that because for the Philippian church for Epaphroditus and for Paul their goal was singular they had one goal in mind the advancement of the gospel so whatever it takes for the gospel to advance I will support you a hundred percent Paul supports them by writing this letter to them, encouraging them not to lose hope uh, despite, you know, the area that they're in, in terms of the persecution that they might receive. And at the same time, the Philippian church is supporting Paul with whatever it took. If it took one of us to, co to go over there, walk 1,900 miles, 1,900 kilometers, then it has to be done. And Epaphroditus was the one to do it. And the reason why they're able to kind of work together like this 
is because they had one goal, they had one, um, they had one focus, and that is the advancement of the gospel. And again, um, because of the gospel, they were fueled with love for one another. So, uh, you know, they had compassion for each other for what they're going through. Uh, Philippian church, for what Paul is going through and for what Epaphroditus went through. Uh, and Paul, for them, what they're going through um, in Philippi. Uh, and again, it wasn't just all, uh, I'll do this, or I'm going to support you only by words. Uh, they did it uh, with action. Uh, they did it with, um, they did what they had to do in order to get things done. Um, uh, that's why every time we go back to our text, that's why every time Paul remembers the Philippian church, every time he prays for them, it brings him or fills him with thankfulness and joy. Um, thankfulness and joy for them. Um, so that's one thing that, uh, that's one thing to notice in, in Paul's uh, prayer of thanksgiving in verses uh, 3, 4, and, and 5. The other thing uh, to notice uh, in these verses, in this passage, uh, is that Paul's joy and thanksgiving is not directly attributed to the Philippians themselves. He didn't attribute his thanksgiving and joy directly to them, um, but instead, Paul thanked God, right? Let's read that again. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, for you all, making my prayer with joy. So Paul attributes God directly uh, for his friends uh, at Philippi. Um, and that's, uh, you know, it, what, what Paul is doing is, is, do, is giving credit where credit is due. Uh, that's what he's doing there when he says, I thank my God for you. Uh, because if you think about it, yes, from our perspective as human beings, it was the Philippian church who who partnered with Paul with, in ministry, right? It was the Philippian church who gathered and sent the gifts that Paul needed. Uh, but for Paul, uh, ultimately, for the Philippians to do what they did in support and partnership with him, um, that was all made possible by none other than the power of God through the gospel to work in the lives of those in Philippi so that they are enabled to do what they did for Paul. Uh, so for Paul, it's not a disrespect to the Philippian church that he didn't thank them directly. Uh, for Paul and the Philippian church who are, do, are, are doing this, not for Paul's sake, but for the gospel's sake, um, both of their thanksgiving uh, is directed towards the God of the gospel. Uh, and I think um, that's what we should also do as uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to a goal that we have set for ourselves. Um, and right now, again, the, the goal is in terms of our society, in terms of our help towards our society, our goal is to uh, work with each other in unity. That's what I said, right? Have one goal, have one direction that we're pu all pushing towards, and that is to fight inequality, uh, and not just inequality at its surface, to fight what it, is at the root of uh, racial inequality and injustice. That is hatred in the hearts of men, and ultimately that sin. And we fight that as Christians by proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of love uh, that God showed through the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to have that same goal as believers. Otherwise, we're all going to be bickering uh, with each other on how to defeat this uh, problem. Uh, and again, that's what we see uh, with Paul and the Philippian church. So again, if our society, uh, our goal as a society is to make uh, change and advance the cause of racial equality, we cannot do it divided uh, where one group focuses on one thing and another group is focused on another thing. Meanwhile, all of us are supposed to be working towards the same goal. It's like having, uh, you know, it's like us pulling one thing and some of us are pulling to the right, some of us are pulling to the left uh, because we don't really know where this thing is going. We don't really know what's at, what's at the root of this thing. Um, and every time we try to pull, instead of it, um, you, know, being make, you know, being easier, it makes it harder because we're pulling in different directions. So what Paul and the Philippian church is telling us, no, no, have one goal in mind, all pull or push towards 
that direction with love for each other and unity. Uh, and again, uh, our goal as believers, as Christians, is that of the gospel, uh, is to share the gospel to everybody, to, 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 to cut the root off of racism uh, and racial inequality and injustice all around the world. Um, And, and I want to quote uh, somebody here uh, that I saw um, post. Uh, Tony Dungy, if you're an NFL football fan, he was a former coach. And I think he um, you know, articulated uh, what I'm trying to say here. Hopefully you get what I'm trying to say. But um, if not, uh, hopefully what Tony Dungy said in his letter uh, will, will help us understand what, what I meant by, uh, you know, let's work together instead of against each other. Uh, we're, we're pulling, uh, we're pulling the same thing. We're, we're trying to, we're trying to defeat uh, injustice in the world, whether it be racially or anything else. Um, but we have to focus on the goal. Where are we trying to go with this? Um, Tony Dungy wrote this. America is a very sad place today. Uh, we have seen a man die senselessly uh, at the hands. Uh, of the very people who are supposed to be protecting our citizens. Uh, we have seen people protest his death uh, by destroying property and dreams of people in their own community. The very people they are protesting for. We have many people pointing fingers of blame, painting the opposite side with a broad brush. We have anger and bitterness winning out over logic and reason. We have distrust and prejudice winning out over love and respect. Now, what happened to George Floyd was inexcusable, and it should never happen. Justice needs to be served. But in seeking justice, we can't fall into the trap of prejudging every police officer we see. What started out as peaceful protests have devolved into arson and looting, and that should never happen either. Yes, there should be protests. But we do not have license to perform criminal acts because we are angry. Today, we are a divided country. We are divided racially, politically, and socioeconomically. And Satan is laughing at us because that is exactly what he wants. Dysfunction, mistrust, and hatred help his, king, or the, his kingdom flourish. Satan's kingdom flourish. Well, what is the answer then? I believe it has to start with those of us who claim to be Christians. We have to come to the forefront and demonstrate the qualities of the one we claim to follow, Jesus Christ. We can't be silent. As Dr. King said many years ago, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. But we can't go forward with judgmental, bitter spirits. We need to be proactive, but do it in the spirit of trying to help make things better. And it can't be just the African-American churches. It has to be all churches taking a stand and saying we're going to be on the forefront of meaningful dialogue and meaningful change. We have to be willing to speak the truth in love, but we have to recognize that we are not fighting against other people. We are fighting against Satan and his kingdom of spiritual darkness. In the words of the Apostle Paul, do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good, Romans 12, 21. And that was by, again, Tony Dungy, former NFL coach. And I totally agree with what he just said. Uh, and just like what I've said earlier, what I've said on my posts on Facebook that some of you have read, um, this goes deeper than just skin color. This is not just about racism. This problem goes way deeper than that. It is about the condition of the human heart. Uh, ultimately, hatred is driving all of these actions, from the murder of George Floyd, the riots and looting, and even to the arguments that are going on in Facebook because of these events. We cannot let hatred and anger dictate what we ought to do as a society if we want to advance the cause of equality, we want to advance the cause of justice for everybody among human beings. Uh, we need to work together in love. And again, that love uh, can only be given by God. 
as a fruit of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through the gospel. Uh, and I think that's what Paul's news for us here um, in the Philippians, in the text for today. One goal, and that is the gospel. Because once everybody understands what the gospel is, the gospel of love, once that Holy Spirit invades your heart, it will change you to what? Not just tolerate your enemies, not just tolerate your neighbor, but love your enemies and love your neighbor as well. Uh, and I think when that happens, no more racism. Um, ultimately, we are not in a race war. We are in a spiritual battle. A battle between truth versus deception. A, a battle between love versus hate. Right versus wrong. So what we need to do as Christians is we need to stop viewing this issue with the lens of politics and the media. Okay. What we need to do is start viewing this issue through the lens of scriptures. I'm talking to all believers out there. Stop looking at media. And then go with whatever view they have or whatever they, think they, whatever they think is right. The word of God is authoritative. View it through the lens of Scripture. I even saw a post on, uh, I think it was Twitter, uh, uh, that said that, um, you know, Jesus never, uh, something about all lives matter and how Jesus never said all lives matter or something like that. Uh, but Jesus, also, but Jesus said, you know, uh, the Samaritan lives matter, or the children's lives matter, or um, you know, the women's lives matter. Uh, and then at the end, it's it's about a focus on the Black Lives Matters movement. Uh, like, listen, when when, we, when, all, when you say all lives matter, it's true, biblically, it's true. Christ, John three sixteen, died for the whole world. For him, for Christ, all lives matter. So whoever posted that uh, is taking Jesus' words out of context. Jesus never said uh, in the Bible that Samaritan lives matter. He never said that. Uh, the purpose of, again, the Samaritan lives is to have compassion for your neighbor. Uh, not just walk, walk, when you see your neighbor in trouble, not just to walk by him and just pray for him. No, to have compassion for him, to actually do something to help that neighbor out. Uh, so that's the context of that. Uh, when Jesus said that, um, you know, children's lives matter, it's because the disciples were telling the children to go away. No, for Jesus, the children are the ones with, quote, unquote, childlike faith that we all need to have. That's the context of that. So uh, to twist that, to fit your own agenda, is not how we're supposed to read the Bible. That's not how we, what we teach here in this church. Uh, and hopefully, I, I don't know if any of you saw that post, but hopefully we don't say yes to that and thumbs up to that. No. Uh, <laughs> That's not what it is. That's coming from, uh, 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 you know, a background of, uh, you know, people uh, talking about all lives matter to, to divert attention away from the Black Lives Matters movement. And that's not what, what all lives matter ultimately means. Um, yes, all lives matter for sure. Um, but that's not to go against the Black Lives Matters movement because they're lives, they're lives too, right? Every, every, we're talking about human lives here. And we're talking about, if we're talking about black lives, we're not talking about just black lives in America. We're talking about black lives in, in, New, in, in Nigeria or wherever it is that um, African, um, Africans are actually getting, uh, Christian Africans are getting uh, killed uh, because of their faith. Their lives matter too. Um, and, and again, uh, we, we, we can't twist biblical scripture to fit our own agendas. Uh, and, and the Bible talks about what the Bible talks about in Philippians that we're studying right now uh, is that, you know what? We have to have one goal, okay? That goal is the gospel. And through the gospel, all these other problems that we have as a society will change. But we need to keep pulling in the same direction in unity, no matter what color we are. Uh, and I think that's what it means for us to, to partner with each other. Uh, and that's what it means here in the Philippians, to partner with each other. Uh, through prayer uh, and, and working towards the same goal, uh, just like what Paul and the Philippians are doing in our text this morning. So uh, we're going to stop here um, for now, um, and then we'll take up verses 6 to 8 um, that next week. Uh, and, and verses 6 to 8 is huge. Uh, um, 
Well, you'll see next week, but read it for yourselves before you come attend our, our, um, our service next week, and hopefully you can uh, you know, get more out of, out of the, the message if you do that. Um, so um, having said that, let's close with a word of prayer, and hopefully I'll see you again next week. Let's pray.